It's time to start uh, this session. Uh, this session is about uh, clothes and fluid, and we have uh, four presentations. Uh, the first, pre uh, first paper is, uh, the title is a Mechanics of Wear Modeling of Clothes Appearance. Uh, okay. uh, Shahara Otajiri will present. Yeah. Please welcome Jahara by a big applause. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to our talk. Um, I'll be presenting our paper. I'm Zara Montezeri, and our co-authors are Chang Zhao uh, Yunfei, uh, Chang Shi Zheng, and my PhD advisor, Shuang Zhao. Designing and modeling fabrics is important for many applications, such as online retail, textile design, and entertainment, like game and uh, movies. Despite uh, a rich history in computer graphics, uh, accurately modeling fabrics remain challenging. Cloth consists of multiple yarns, and each yarn uh, consists of hundreds of fibers. Individual fibers are not visible, uh, but their arrangement makes a big difference in overall look. Here, uh, while the top and bottom fabrics have identical weave patterns, uh, and colors, but the warp yarns um, in both textiles have different size and fuzziness. And that makes these two models have a very different look. Using existing models, given fiber level geometries, we can model any textile, knowing the pattern. Micro appearance uh, yarn models have enabled remarkable rendering quality for fabrics. But uh, what if a piece of fabric is uh, being stretched? Uh, well, a piece of fabric is stretched with the environment. Um, it, it yarns and fibers arrangement changes, uh, which can in turn strongly alter the fabric's macroscopic appearance. But unfortunately, any of the existing models support this phenomenon. Here's the gap. How about mechanical aware models that benefits fiber level details? Historically, the search of clot appearance modeling and simulation have advanced largely independently. We bridge the gap by, combined, but by combining the techniques from both areas to model clot appearance in mechanical aware sport. First, let's see how mechanical responses of a fabric affects its overall appearance. Here we show two photographs of a real fabric, which uh, its rest shape on the left and stretched state on the right. In this example, the appearance of the fabric differs a lot between the two states. Interesting, right? Theoretically, this effect can be captured by simulating clot dynamics at the fiber level, but this is normally computationally intractable. We address this, this problem by simulating mainly at yarn level and introducing fiber level details afterward. Then, using some magic, we deform the fibers uh, based on the yarn level simulation. And that's fast and fun. Our technique is able to capture the thinning of yarns under stretching. And uh, without, sorry, without our me method, the appearance is very inaccurate. We can see it again, right? All right, let's briefly review some prior works in clot appearance and simulation. Traditionally, cloth are often modeled as 2D thin sheets. These models offer adequate quality for rendering cloth appearance when viewed from distance, uh, when individual fibers are barely visible. Uh, but they lack the details to reproduce plausible close-up renderings. Recently, a family of micro appearance models have been introduced to, the model, to modeling the fabric appearance. Unlike traditional models, these techniques explicitly model fabric fiber level microstructures and have achieved remarkable visual quality. 
Unfortunately, these models are mechanically agnostic. In our paper, we use a procedural variant of these models, mechanical aware. Uh, on the simulation side, the traditional approach is to treat the cloth as an elastic sheet uh, that is linearly elastic and isotropic. These methods, again, neglect fabrics uh, detail. Alternat alternatively, a cloth can be simulated by tracking the motion of its uh, constituent yarns using elastic rods or uh, material point methods, or MPM. Unfortunately, these methods are already expensive when applied to individual yarns, let alone fibers. Um, in our paper, we use the work from Jiang et al. for our simulation. Now I'll provide more details on our technique. Here's the pipeline. Well, our pre-processing uh, step consists of two sub-steps. Training phase one. The goal of, is, of this step is to ensure uh, the yarn center line resulted from yarn level simulation to be consistent with the uh, simulation from fiber level uh, under the same initial condition, for co of course. This is achieved through uh, fitting yarn level material parameters using small scale fiber level simulation. Training phase two. Given the fiber level parameters, we simulate all the fibers and obtain the deformed fiber geometry. On the other side, given the yarn level parameters from training phase one, we simulate the center lines and obtain the matching yarn geometry. Using some training, we learn the mapping between yarn simulation and actual fiber simulation. We have two main contributions during this pre-processing, multi-scale simulation and the training mode. Let me start with this one first, which is relating yarn level forces to fiber level geometries. Given the forces provided by the yarn level simulation, we are looking for a transformation T to apply on procedurally generated fibers and, ex and uh, expect the same deformation as if we had simulated all the fibers, like this. Since the mapping is high dimensional, nonlinear, and quite complicated, we chose to use a neural network to represent the mapping. The deformation T at any cross section along the yarn largely depend on the external forces acting at the nearby locations. Note that compression is a, uh, we should look at the neighbors because compression is a local event. To train our neural network, we simulate a single yarn under a range of conditions at both yarn and fiber level. And for each pair of simulation results, we compare the simulated fiber curves and procedurally and generated fiber curves, which are guided by the yarn level simulation. This means when our neural network estimate the 2D uh, transformation T at every cross section, uh, it must take an input to the de deformation gradient in a small window around the cross section. So that's our input and output of our neural network. Our supervised neural network involves four fully connected hidden layers. The network acts as a 1D nonlinear filter along a yarn center line uh, and turns the simulated deformation gradient F to cross-sectional fiber deformation T. That's it. Now let's look at this phase, matching yarn level and fiber level simulation. In fiber level simulation, the parameters are set based on the physical uh, properties of a fiber, say if it's a yarn, if it's a cotton or silk. In yarn level simulation, we need to set the parameters so that the simulated yarn curves under the same initial condition closely match the center line of the, corresp uh, of the corresponding fiber bundles in the fiber level simulation. For more details, please see our paper.
All right, let's check out the runtime. At runtime, given the individual yarn center lines and external forces along them, which are determined by the simulation, we simulate the dynamics of full textiles only at yarn level to obtain the yarn geometry. We procedurally generate fibers following these center lines and uh, using our neural network, we further discuss, uh, we further adjust the fibers to represent the textile mechanical responses. And we get the fiber geometry. Now let's go over some results. In this example, a cloth yarn is stretched at the end points. Our technique accurately captures the thinning of the yarn, which is our result on top. And uh, the reference in the middle is the simulation in fiber level, while bottom line ignores the fiber mechanics. In this example, a yarn is compressed by a few rigid cylinders, causing complex and spatially varying deformations. Again, our result obtained using our yarn level simulations successfully. Um, and again, the reference is in the middle, which is the fiber level simulation. We now show full fabrics modeled for, um, um, for a neat uh, cloth. This example shows a uh, fabric being stretched in all direction. Our technique captures the appearance changes of this model driven by the thinning of yarn, an effect that cannot be reproduced by existing models. In this one, we show another piece of knitted cloth fabric stretched by uh, a moving rigid sphere. The contact forces resulting from the movement of the sphere causes complex deformations and, and the appearance changes across the cloth surface, which are again successfully captured by a technique. This following example contains a three-dimensional knitted glove model when stretched from both from the other ends. The glove appearance changes prominently due to the rearrangement of the yarns and fibers. And we can compare it with the bottom line, which is basically ignoring all these fiber level deformations. Please note the macro scale appearance fibers in both colors and highlights between our model and the bottom line. Yay. Lastly, we show a large piece of woven cloth being stretched in two directions simultaneously, causing complicated and spatially varying deformations. Despite being at a much smaller scale compared to the entire fabric, these deformations still yield significant change to the fabric's overall appearance, right? Conclusions and limitations. We introduce the first of a kind technique for cloth appearance that is capable of capturing rearrangement of cloth yarns and fibers that are caused by the external forces, uh, of course, without simulating all single fibers. Since our technique does not simulate fibers explicitly, it cannot capture uh, complex fiber interactions, such as tearing apart a cloth, um, yet remained an interesting future research. 
Further, since yarns in our yarn level simulation have no explicit boundaries, two yarn curves can get very close to each other and we may see self intersection. Lastly, uh, the procedural model used by our method supports only the yarn uh, types that are previously measured by CT scanners. So generalizing our model for a wider range of yarn types can benefit future applications. This brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you. Uh, it's time for your question. Thanks for the talk. Uh, my question is that you, um, is your method real time or, um, and if it's not, what is the limitation? The limitation, if it is not real time, and the limitation is a pre processing step in which uh, we have the neural network to be trained. So the training of the neural network uh, is the pre processing step, and once we have a neural net that is already trained, then uh, the rest of it can be in real time, although ours currently is not. Uh, it can be, yeah. Ours is at the, at the runtime, um, once we have a trained neural net, then it can be um, real time. And we are thinking even on generalizing this method on a GPU as well, because it can be in uh, independently as well. So um, that would be an interesting future work um, to have it on a GPU as well to make it even fast. But at the runtime, it's uh, quite fast. Uh, but the bottleneck is currently training neural network because of the, all the simulations that has needed to be done. Yeah. Thank you. Also, thank you for a nice talk. I wanted to ask, uh, so the training data mm -hmm. for the fiber model come from the fiber level simulation? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So we have, uh, uh, we have the neural network for four different types of yarns, silk, cotton, polyester, and rayon. So these are all having different fiber arrangements, and we need one neural network for each yarn type. So we have tested our neural network for these four um, different yarn types, but it can be generalized to more uh, different other types of yarns. But the, uh, the limitation here is that we need to have the CT scan. Uh, so we, would, we need the fiber uh, geometries, the fiber detail geometries of each yarn in order to train our neural network. So we didn't have more than four data sets to have uh, our neural network trained. Yeah. I think I also think uh, uh, oh presentation is very interesting. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you again. Thank you.